moving forward uh, with the material, uh, we're still within this topic of payment uh, materials. Um, this is the generic cross section for a, for a payment system. What I wanted to uh, note now is that uh, we have been through discussing all soil like materials, which is what supports the ASPA players. And I would now like to jump and uh, talk about the uh, mechanical properties of asphalt concrete. So we have been through this uh, soil uh, properties and resilient modulus. And now let's talk about asphalt concrete. So in essence, asphalt concrete is a multi-phase material. Uh, if you look at the image here, you will see aggregates, a range of sizes, and uh, they consist of 95% consist of, of, of the material by mass. And then there is a bitumen, which is a product of uh, distillation of oil. And uh, it varies, but let's say on, on average, it's about 5% by weight. And then in terms of volume, uh, the voids in, in the asphalt concrete can range between usually 3%, 4%, 5%. And if you have open graded mixtures, it can, and, uh, it can go up to 25%. Now, uh, that also depends on the, on the compaction level, of course. And as I mentioned, every 1% missing in compaction degree ends up to be 1% extra in, uh, in air voids. All right, now, um, aggregates. Aggregates to a, a good approximation are elastic. If you were to test the mechanical properties of the individual aggregates, you would, end, you would end up to uh, uh, observe an elastic solid behavior. And the bitumen sometimes called asphalt binder is uh, in reality a viscoelastic fluid in fact the theory of viscoelasticity is uh, split into two elasticity uh, two branches. There is a branch that deals with viscoelastic fluids, and there's a branch that deals with viscoelastic solids. Um, example for viscoelastic fluids, uh, ketchup, uh, paint, where you paint your walls. And uh, what happens for us, we would like to think of asphalt concrete as a viscoelastic solid. So there is a lot of solid particles, and uh, the asphalt binder that covers each of them um, introduces some viscosity to the system. Viscosity, by that I mean time effects, and uh, in our case also thermal effects. The overall uh, outcome of mixing asphalt binder uh, of the order of 5% by weight with the aggregates that are basically solid, elastic solids, we end up with an outcome that is a viscoelastic solid. And in order to explain how asphalt uh, behaves when exposed to load, we have to look at the theory of viscoelasticity for solids. And specifically, what I would like to do is to consider the theory of linear viscoelasticity. In reality, asphalt concrete is not linear viscoelastic. It's, it is uh, more complex than that. But uh, let's say for the purpose of this course, uh, we let's think of asphalt as a linear viscoelastic solid. So what the chart shows here is the response of a linear viscoelastic solid to a creep test. Let me explain again what is a creep test. We take uh, an element, and I'm thinking uh, 1D for now. We take an element, a viscoelastic element, and we place some kind of... Uh, load on top of the element, and then we monitor the strains in the vertical direction. So obviously, the weight does not change over time, so it's constant load that is being applied. And this is why you have the first chart. It shows T versus stress, which is a function of time. And uh, if we, at some point, let's say at time equals zero, we place the weight on top of the linear viscoelastic solid, we have a jump in the stress. That jump represents the weight of the mass divided by the, the cross-sectional area of the element. And then since nothing changes over time, uh, the stress state does not change. And we saw that in the case of uh, uh, linear elastic materials, the strain response is the same as the stress, because the stress and strain are connected by the elastic uh, modulus, or Young's modulus. In the case of viscoelasticity, the strain, which is plotted here, is showing a, a more complex behavior. Before load was applied, let's say the material was completely unloaded, so of course there was nothing happening and there is no strain. The moment that this weight was placed on the element, there was a small jump here in the strain. We call this epsilon uh, zero or sub zero. And then if we monitor the strain over time, again, the strain is the strain in the vertical direction, how this element is compressed, then there is some kind of a behavior that looks like this. Um, there is um, an asymptote at infinity. It seems that the material would uh, stop deforming at infinite time, I mean, theoretically infinite time. And that strain level, we let's call it epsilon infinity. So we have epsilon zero and epsilon infinity to represent 
the instantaneous response. This is a strain that happens the moment that you apply the stress. And this is the strain that appears uh, after a very long time. Very long time, I mean, could be weeks, could be months, could be years, depending on, on the material itself. And, and this is uh, one, one D view of viscoelasticity. elasticity. So one D view. Let's write this in a more formal way. We start with the stress. The stress as a function of time equals sigma naught for all times greater than uh, zero, and it is equal to zero else. What about the strain? So the strain, I'll write an expression here. This is not the only option, but this expression um, is capable of reproducing this shape of an initial jump and then an asymptote. Uh, it says that the strain at any time t is equal to the strain at infinity plus strain, the instantaneous strain minus the strain at infinity divided by 1 plus, and here we have in parentheses t, which is time, divided by tau d, which is just a constant. It represents uh, the way that uh, this curve is uh, is. Uh, uh, is appearing, or it controls the shape of the curve. And then we have another uh, parameter, which is n, with a small subscript d to indicate the power. So if this expression is able to reproduce this, we can check at the extreme cases. Let's say t is 0. If t is 0, we introduce 0 here. And then this is the denominator is 1. And then we have epsilon infinity plus epsilon 0 minus epsilon infinity. That means that if we plug in t equals 0, this expression gives us epsilon 0, which is what we expect. And if t is very, very large, then Everything here goes to zero, and we end up with epsilon infinity. So basically, tau and n are shape parameters. Their uh, numerical values, they are both positive, by the way, and their numerical values are controlling how fast the transition between uh, zero and infinity happens and, uh, and what shape would this curve uh, look like. So if this curve uh, would be very sharp or very uh, slow to reach epsilon infinity. Now, if you remember, and I, I have to remove something here. For elastic materials, we defined the compliance to be strain at any time t versus divided by stress. And in the case of elastic materials, this ratio ended up to be a constant value. In, in our case, we just plug in epsilon at any time t here, and this is going to be sigma zero, which is a constant stress in the crypt test. And we find the following. Epsilon infinity divided by sigma zero plus epsilon zero divided by sigma zero minus epsilon infinity divided by sigma zero and everything is divided by one plus t over tau d to the power of n. So this is just plugging in the strain that is observed in the crypt test and that goes in here and the stress is just sigma naught and we end up with the compliance. As you can see, the compliance that we get is not a constant, it's a function of time. So d of t is called it's called the linear viscoelastic creep compliance. And it represents the response of the material to a stress history that is applied like a step, exactly like in the creep test. For, for linear viscoelastic solids, it is convenient to make a definition because everything is scaled by the stress sigma zero. If it is doubled, then the strains are doubled. And that means that uh, we can define the ratio epsilon infinity to sigma naught uh, stress that we apply in the grip test. We define, it, we define it to equal d infinity and epsilon zero divided by sigma zero defined to be d zero. And then we end up with an expression for the grip compliance. The grip compliance is given as this expression. Now, there are other options. This is not the only one, but there are four parameters here. D infinity is a material property. D zero is a material property. Tau D 
is a material property and the power here nd is a material property. If you were to plot this in a double log scale, meaning we place log of d and then log of t on the two axes, you will see that the outcome is a sigmoidal shape. Where the value here is d infinity, the value here is d0, and how fast does this sigmoidal shape uh, changes between d0 and d infinity is determined by uh, the power nd, and the location of this inflection point in this uh, skewed space, if this is happening here or here, this is controlled by tau d. read what I just wrote. Now I'm reversing the, the situation. Let's say the function d of t is magically known. It is given to us. This uh, element that was here, standing and being loaded, this element is characterized by a creep function, d of t. So if somehow we were magically handed this uh, time function, d of t, we were able then to calculate the strain in this creep test. This is the load that we apply. So this is something we control and know. This is given to us. And then the strain can be calculated simply by multiplying d of t by sigma naught, and for every value of time of interest, let's say I would like to know what is the strain when t equals zero, I just use t equals zero in the grid compliance expression and calculate the strain at that time. If I would like to know what is happening at t equal to 1,000 seconds, I just plug in t 1,000 into this uh, expression for the grid compliance and uh, able am in a position to calculate the strain after 1,000 seconds. And if I would like to calculate for uh, 1,000 years, I just take t as 1,000 years, and place it here and calculate the strain after 1,000 years of being loaded by a, by a mass. So this is a bit uh, different than elastic materials where you are given an elastic modulus and the stress and strain are directly related. Here there's time effect because the answer to what is the strain level for this stress level depends on when, when do you want the value. Do you want it now? Do you want it in 10 hours or in 20 years? And there's also another difference. The material is characterized by a time function, which means that the basic property of the material is not a number, like the modulus of concrete or the modulus of steel, but it's a time function. If I were to send this element to a laboratory and ask, can you send me back the material properties, their answer would be a time function. Um, last point uh, before I take a short break is about linearity. As you can see, the, the title here is linear viscoelasticity. Obviously, the stress is constant, nothing is changing, and the resulting strain is, is nonlinear. We actually know that the V of D is a, is a power function and plots like a sigmoid in a, in a log log space. So, why is it linear? What makes this a linear material if uh, an, upon application of a constant stress, we end up with a strain that changes non-linearly uh, with, with time? <laughs> 